The Door Lectures on Mental Science by Thomas Troward. Lecture 4. The Life of the Spirit. Part 2 of 2. It is always the presence of a definite intention that distinguishes the intelligent receptive attitude of mind from a merely sponge-like absorbency, which sucks in any and every influence that may happen to be floating round, for we must not shut our eyes to the fact that there are various influences in the mental atmosphere by which we are surrounded, and some of them of the most undesirable kind. Clear and definite intention is therefore as necessary in our receptive attitude as in our active and creative one, and if our intention is to have our own thoughts and feelings molded into such forms as to express those of the spirit, then we establish that relation to the spirit which, by the conditions of the case, must necessarily lead us to the conception of new ideals vitalist by a power which will enable us to bring them into concrete manifestation. It is in this way that we become differentiating centers of the divine thought giving it expression in form in the world of space and time, and thus has solved the great problem of enabling the universal to act upon the plane of the particular without being hampered by those limitations which the merely generic law of manifestation imposes upon it. It is just here that subconscious mind performs the function of a bridge between the finite and the infinite as noted in my Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science, and it is for this reason that a recognition of its susceptibility to impression is so important. By establishing, then, a personal relation to the life of the spirit, the sphere of the individual becomes enlarged. The reason is that he allows a greater intelligence than his own to take the initiative, and since he knows that this intelligence is also the very principle of life itself, he cannot have any fear that it will act in any way to the diminution of his individual life, for that would be to stultify its own operation, it would be self-destructive action which is a contradiction in terms to the conception of creative spirit. Knowing, then, that by its inherent nature this intelligence can only work to the expansion of the individual life, we can rest upon it with the utmost confidence and trust it to take an initiative which will lead to far greater results than any we could forecast from the standpoint of our own knowledge. So long as we insist on dictating the particular form which the action of the spirit is to take, we limit it, and so close against ourselves avenues of expansion which might otherwise have been open to us, and if we ask ourselves why we do this we shall find that in the last resort it is because we do not believe in the spirit as a forming power. We have, indeed, advanced to the conception of it as executive power, which will work to a prescribed pattern, but we have yet to grasp the conception of it as versed in the art of design, and capable of elaborating schemes of construction, which will not only be complete in themselves, but also in perfect harmony with one another. When we advance to the conception of the spirit as containing in itself the ideal of form as well as of power, we shall cease from the effort of trying to force things into a particular shape, whether on the inner or the outer plane, and shall be content to trust the inherent harmoniousness or beauty of the spirit to produce combinations far in advance of anything that we could have conceived ourselves. This does not mean that we shall reduce ourselves to a condition of apathy, in which all desire, expectation and enthusiasm have been quenched, for these are the mainspring of our mental machinery, but on the contrary their action will be quickened by the knowledge that there is working at the back of them a formative principle so infallible that it cannot miss its mark, so that however good and beautiful the existing forms may be, we may always rest in the happy expectation of something still better to come. And it will come by a natural law of growth, because the spirit is in itself the principle of increase. They will grow out of present conditions for the simple reason that if you are to reach some further point it can only be by starting from where you are now. Therefore it is written, despise not the day of small things. There is only one proviso attached to this forward movement of the spirit in the world of our own surroundings, and that is that we shall cooperate with it, and this cooperation consists in making the best use of existing conditions in cheerful reliance on the spirit of increase to express itself through us, and for us, because we are in harmony with it. This mental attitude will be found of immense value in setting us free from worry and anxiety, and as a consequence our work will be done in a much more efficient manner. We shall do the present work for its own sake, knowing that herein is the principle of unfoldment, and doing it simply for its own sake we shall bring to bear upon it a power of concentration which cannot fail of good results, and this quite naturally and without any toilsome effort. We shall then find that the secret of cooperation is to have faith in ourselves because we first have faith in God, and we shall discover that this divine self-confidence is something very different from a boastful egotism which assumes a personal superiority over others. It is simply the assurance of a man who knows that he is working in accordance with a law of nature. 
He does not claim as a personal achievement what the law does for him, but on the other hand he does not trouble himself about outcries against his presumptuous audacity raised by persons who are ignorant of the law which he is employing. He is therefore neither boastful nor timorous, but simply works on in cheerful expectancy because he knows that his reliance is upon a law which cannot be broken. In this way, then, we must realize the life of the Spirit as being also the law of the Spirit. The two are identical, and cannot deny themselves. Our recognition of them gives them a new starting point through our own mentality, but they still continue to be the same in their nature, and unless limited or inverted by our mental affirmation of limited or inverted conditions, they are bound to work out into fuller and continually fuller expression of the life, love, and beauty which the Spirit is in itself. Our path, therefore, is plain, it is simply to contemplate the life, love, and beauty of the originating spirit and affirm that we are already giving expression to it in our thoughts and in our actions however insignificant they may at present appear. This path may be very narrow and humble in its beginning, but it ever grows wider and mounts higher, for it is the continually expanding expression of the life of the spirit which is infinite and knows no limits. Lecture 4. The Life of the Spirit. End of Lecture. Need help understanding Troward's teachings? The Thomas Troward lectures contain very deep and powerful information. But to get the most out of them, require repeated listening and in-depth study. Troward had only one personal student, Genevieve Berend, and her book Your Invisible Power distills the essence of Troward's lectures in a concise and easy-to-understand format. For many, this is a much-preferred way to learn Troward's teachings. Click the link below this video to visit yourinvisiblepower.us and learn more about Genevieve Berend's recently updated book.